It was supposed to be such a simple project. I just wanted to change the drain in my bathtub. So I went to the hardware store. I was met with a great deal of customer satisfaction and service. Guys, I walked in. Guys were like, hey, how you doing? Glad you're here. You need help with anything? No thanks, guys. I got this. Went to the plumbing section. I bought my drain. Went home. Took the old one out. Put the new one in the hole. And that's where it all started. I started to spin, and it just it wouldn't thread. It wouldn't go in. And so I started looking. It turns out the shoe underneath my tub that the drain screws into, super old brass thing that none of the standard plugs today are going to screw into. So I had to change the shoe. Not a big deal, okay? I've done it before. We can do it again. It's just going to take a little more time. So I go back to the hardware store second time. I walk in the door. Hey, how you doing? You need help with anything? No thanks, guys. Still got this. Went back to the plumbing section, bought my shoe, came home, put it under the tub, screwed the drain in. We're looking good. Went to hook it up to the drain like the plumbing part. Another problem. You see, this new shoe it had like a quarter inch drop that my old shoe did not have, so the pipes weren't going to fit up and weren't going to meet up. That means everything that was installed already was useless. So now I had to put a new over, or, uh, yeah, the overflow system on my tub, and so now I'm starting to get a little frustrated because this was supposed to be a 10-minute project. I had other things I wanted to do this day. So I went back to the hardware store a third time, walk in the door. Hey, how you doing? I don't want to talk about it, guys. I'm on a mission. I buy the overflow system, I go home, I ran to another snag, I'll spare you the details, we got it hooked up. Long story short, this was supposed to be a 10 minute project. This was not supposed to be three hours and three trips to the hardware store, right? And that is just one of many situations that should have taught me this lesson by now, that when you go to work on an old home, projects are always gonna take five times longer than they're supposed to. Amen? Yeah. First service, we got more amens on that than we did when I preached the gospel. Like, this is just something that people resonate with, all right? But here, there's a life lesson here. You know, anytime we try to seek to accomplish something, anytime there's an objective, there's going to be obstacles in the way that we have to overcome. And the greater the goal, the greater the obstacles. And this isn't even something that's limited to human experience. When we read through Scripture, it even seems like God has to deal with this to some extent. Because he has this amazing plan to save people. It's incredible. Right now, we have this problem where humanity is kind of at odds with God. There's a breakdown in our relationship, and we're separated from him. And we, that's caused by sin, by our choices, by our actions, by the way we live our lives in opposition to what he calls us to. And this is a huge problem for this life. Because we are creatures that are made in such a way that we find the most satisfaction and peace when we are in harmony with our creator. But it's an even bigger problem when we talk about what comes after this life. Because right now, if we're in opposition with God, we're cut off from the life he wants to give. And if these bodies of ours give out while we're still separated from that life, we will not have life forever and ever. And that's a huge problem. Also, that's not what God wants. He didn't make us so that we could be separated from him. He created humanity so that he could be with them so that he could be united with them in eternity forever and ever and have fellowship. That's what he wants. And so he came up with this plan to save us. And it all culminates in the person of Jesus Christ. When he died on the cross, his perfection became a substitute for our dysfunction. And that perfection washes over us so that those things that we've done, we've said, we've thought, those actions that we've chosen that separate us from God, Jesus washes over that. It's all water under the bridge. We're saved. We have that reconciliation with God. And then God said, I don't want this to be limited to just people that lived in Jerusalem in first century AD. I want this for every person everywhere in every era. And so he gave a mission to his church. Go and tell the world about what I've done. Tell every person everywhere in every age about what I've done to save them in Jesus. It's a phenomenal plan. But just like everything else, amazing goals and objectives also come with some obstacles that we have to overcome. And when we look through the book of Acts, that's what we see, that the church, when it first gets started, it has some obstacles it has to overcome. And these same obstacles have shown up generation after generation after generation in the church. We today have to overcome the same obstacles that the early church did. And that leads us to the series that we're beginning today. It's called Contagious, a faith that spreads. See, this faith that we have and this this life that Jesus has given us, it's not meant to stay just contained in our own lives, in our own hearts, in our own little bubble. It's meant to radiate from our lives. 
It's meant to spread into our families, into our workplaces, into our neighbors, into our friendships. It's meant to radiate off of us so that every person, everywhere, in every age can know what God has done to save us and to be with us. And if we're going to be faithful to that calling, church, we're going to have to be aware of the obstacles that stand in our way. That's what this series is about. And we're going to be looking at the early church and its, its inception and its early life in the book of Acts. So if you've got your Bibles with you, you can turn to the book of Acts, chapter 1 is where we're going to be. Or you can download the FCC Mammoth app on your mobile device. Click the Sunday button on the navigation bar. You've got a Bible, you've got sermon notes, you've got ways to connect with us after the sermon. Phenomenal tool to have at your disposal. Now some of you may know this, some of you may not, but the book of Acts is the continuation of the book of Luke. It's kind of like Luke part 2. The book of Luke is the story of Jesus, of his coming to this world, his ministry, his death, his resurrection. Really, it's the story of how God saves us. Acts, or as I like to call it, Luke part two, answers the question, now what do we do? What are we supposed to do now that God has saved us? And if we were to just sum it up in one sentence, it would be this, we act. You see, in this part of the gospel story, there is a lot of work left to be done. And you are a part of this gospel story, by the way. That's not a story that stopped just after the book of Revelation. It's a story of God working in this world to bring Jesus to mankind. You're a part of that. I'm a part of that. And in this part of the story, there's work to do. Take a look at Acts chapter 1 as it gets started. Verse 1 it says this. In my former book, Theophilus, and we'll stop there. Theophilus is the guy that this book is written to. He's also who the book of Luke was addressed to. And this says, in my former book. And so that's how we know that this is Luke part two. It's written to the same dude by the same dude. So it goes, in my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he'd chosen. That's how the book of Luke ends. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and he spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you've heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So a couple of notes to take note of, a couple of things to point out, so that we understand what's really developing here in this part of the story. The first is this detail of 40 days. Jesus met with his disciples for 40 days. Now, 40 is a literal number. I mean, this is... 40-day period between Easter and Pentecost. We can measure it on a calendar. But 40 in the Bible is also a number of great symbolic value because that's a number that seems to surround every instance where God is preparing his people for something. You go back to the book of Exodus. Moses goes up onto the mountain, uh, Mount Sinai. He meets with God for 40 days, 40 nights, and God gives him the law. He's preparing Moses, and he's preparing his people for the covenant they're about to enter into. If you go a little further in that story, the Israelites, they wander in the wilderness for 40 years. And we're told in the book of Deuteronomy that this was a time of testing and discipline. God was preparing them to be a holy people before they enter into the promised land. We fast forward even more, maybe a more relevant story. Jesus, at the beginning of his, his gospel story, he wanders in the wilderness and is tested by Satan for 40 days. And this is a time of preparation because the very next event that happens in Jesus' story is he's baptized and begins his official ministry. This is preparation for the work he's going to do. So 40 is a number here that ought to tell us God is preparing these men, these apostles of Jesus, to do something really important. Now the second detail helps us understand a little better what that is. He says, stay in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes. And sometimes today, just because of American culture and televangelist culture and stuff like that, sometimes when we hear the word the Holy Spirit, our radars go off and we start thinking of like being slain in the Spirit and like faith healings and televangelists and stuff like that. But when the Bible talks about the Holy Spirit, it's a much different picture. Far more often it has to do with the Holy Spirit being a helper of sorts. You know, when Jesus, he talks about the Holy Spirit in the book of John, he even calls the Holy Spirit the helper or the advocate. When the Apostle Paul talks about the Holy Spirit in his letters, the, the epistles that we read, he talks about the Holy Spirit as one who empowers us for holiness, so to live the life God calls us to, and he empowers us for faithful ministry, to do the work that God calls us to. 
So this Holy Spirit that, that Jesus is talking about to his apostles, he's going to come. He's the power of God to help them accomplish this huge thing that Jesus is preparing them for. We're starting to get the idea that what he's going to send them out to do is pretty dang important, right? And here's what he's going to tell them to do. Look at verse 6. It says, They gathered around him and they asked, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. But, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. So there is the monumental task that Jesus gives to his disciples. He says, I want you to be my witnesses. I want you to go tell people about what God has done through my death and resurrection. I want you to tell them about this plan he has to save people. And I want you to go to Jerusalem in your hometown and do that. But I want you to just stay there. I want you to go to Judea and Samaria, the surrounding countrysides. I want you to tell those people. I want you to go to the very ends of the earth because every person everywhere in every age deserves to hear what God has done. This is the huge thing that God was preparing these guys for. And church, you and I today have inherited that task. When we said yes to Christ and we said yes to every gift that he offers us, we also said yes to this mission of telling everybody everywhere about this thing that God has done. This is why we exist as a church. It's why God has put us on the earth. It's why Jesus hasn't come back yet, because there's a lot of work to do. And we can't lose sight of that incredible calling and incredible task that God has tasked us with. We could say yes to a lot of good things in this world. We could say yes to a lot of well-intentioned things in this world, but this great thing is the only thing that God has put us on the earth to do. This is what Jesus charged us with. And not only that, he's empowered us for that as well. The same Holy Spirit that the apostles received is the Holy Spirit that we received when we came out of the baptistry. And that same help that he gave them is he, the same help he gives us today. God has given us a job and everything we need in order to accomplish it. And he expects us to do the work. I mean, you think about it this way. If, if you're going to go out on a date or you're going to go out of town, you got a couple kids, you hire a babysitter, you give them a 20, you say, here's some money for pizza. I want you to feed everybody. If you come back and you find that that babysitter pocketed that 20 or they bought a t-shirt on Amazon or something. First service, I said a CD and then I realized nobody buys CDs anymore. If somebody buys a t-shirt with it, you're going to be kind of upset, aren't you? Because you gave them a job. And you gave them everything they needed to get the job done, and yet they chose not to. You're going to be frustrated. Church, God has given us a job. He's empowered us with everything we need to do the job. And he will be frustrated, to say the least, if he finds that we have been unfaithful with what he's called us to. That's why we have to be aware of the obstacles and why this might be the most important series we preach all year. In fact, every series that we've preached since January has been laying groundwork for this series. We started this year with a series called Together. And for three weeks, we talked about what does it mean to be a healthy faith community? What does it mean to have fellowship together in this shared faith? And the thing that we ended on in that series was this idea that what binds us together as a church is our shared calling, the shared labor that God has called us to. This is that labor to tell everybody everywhere what God has done. Next series we preached was a series called Selfless. We were in that for four weeks. We follow a God who is incredibly selfless. He gave his own son, who gave his own life so that we could be saved, so that we could have peace with God. Selfishness is contrary to everything God stands for. And if we are going to be faithful to this task and to be faithful to this mission, we will have to set ourselves aside, our selfish comforts, our selfish preferences, our selfish desires in order to serve him. That attitude is paramount. The next series we preached and just wrapped up was called Made for More. And the tagline was this, sometimes what we settle for in life is less than what God has made us for. And as individuals, we can do that, but as a church, we can do that too. And we can settle for doing a lot of good things without realizing God has made us for this incredible thing. He has made us to be partners with him and co-laborers with him and even co-conspirators with him to tell everybody everywhere in every age how he has liberated them from sin and death. 
That's the greatest calling we could ever take upon ourselves, and he gives us that. That's what he made us for. And that brings us to today, where we start this series talking about the obstacles we have to overcome in order to be the church God dreams us to be, in order to be faithful. These obstacles, they're not just things that we today deal with said it a couple times now, every generation of the church, we see it in the book of Acts, we see it throughout church history, every generation has had to overcome these obstacles. Right at the beginning of the story, just as Jesus gives them their assignment, we see the first obstacle come into play. Look down at verse nine in our passage. It says, after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who's been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you've seen him go into heaven. So here's the funny part of the sermon. This is, this is one of my favorite scenes in the New Testament just because it's kind of funny. Let me explain it. So the apostles are watching Jesus go up into heaven. He, he gets hidden by the clouds and the two angels show up. Here's why that's funny. Every other instance in the book of Luke, remember, Acts is Luke part two. Every other instance where angels show up, people are terrified. And the angels have to tell everybody, don't be afraid. In Luke chapter one, angel shows up to a guy named Zechariah. He says, you're gonna have a baby. His name's gonna be John the Baptist. And he has to tell Zechariah, don't be afraid. Chapter one again, he appears to Mary, the mother of Jesus. And he has to tell Mary, don't be afraid. Luke chapter two, an angel appears to shepherds to announce that Christ has been born. And what does he say, church? Don't be afraid. Luke chapter 24, Jesus is risen from the dead. Some women go to see him at the tomb, but all they find is an angel that shows up. And what does he say? Say it with me. Don't be afraid. Every time an angel shows up, people lose their minds and they have to say, calm down, don't be afraid. Here's why this is funny to me. The disciples are watching Jesus go up into the sky and two angels show up like, poof, And on their lips, you can tell, they're ready to say it, don't be afraid. But instead, they're like, hey, fellas, over here. Like, it's just funny to me. They just totally get ignored. They're so fixed on Jesus that this thing that causes terror every other time, they don't even pay attention. But it's just funny. That's the only value that adds to the sermon, I think. But here's what the angels say. They say, men of Galilee, why are you looking up into the clouds? The same Jesus who went up, he's going to come back in the same way. And when they say that, I don't think they're trying to give words of comfort, like, hey, don't worry, Jesus is going to come back. I know you'll miss him, but he'll be here. I think they're trying to say, fellas, what are you looking up in the sky for? He's coming back. You got work to do. Get busy doing what he told you to. You see, this is the first temptation that the church has to overcome if they're going to be faithful. It's the temptation of inaction, to simply not do what Jesus told us to do. And it's an obstacle that we have to be aware of and guard against because we can very easily fall into that same pit of inaction. And there's a lot of different ways this happens. I'm I'm just going to bring two to our attention this morning because they're kind of what I observe just in my time in the church so forever. Um, (laughs) So this is just kind of what I see. The first is this. Sometimes we forget that Jesus is coming back. And I don't think that we like cognitively forget that. Like we believe he's coming back, but in our actions, in our urgency, in our lives, like we live as if he's not coming back. And here's what I mean by that. Like life gets really busy and in between trying to just raise a family and keep down, you know, keep hold of a job and navigate the twists and the turns that life inevitably is gonna throw our way, it can be really easy just to focus on the immediate stuff, the stuff that needs my attention today. And we can become so focused on just dealing with that that we forget about this really important stuff, or at least it doesn't seem as urgent. Even though it is infinitely more important that Jesus is coming back in this world, it's not happening right now this minute. And so it's easy to lose our urgency when it comes to that truth. It's something that just, it kind of happens sometimes. And we see that a little bit in the scripture. They're looking up at the clouds and they're just kind of twiddling their thumbs, saying, well, Jesus is in the sky. And the angels have to remind them, no, get busy, do the work. And it kind of reminds me of a parable that Jesus tells to his disciples in his ministry. It's, it's about this master that goes on a long journey. And he leaves his estate in the hands of some servants. And to one he gives 10 bags of gold, and to one he gives five bags of gold, and to one he gives one bag of gold. And while the master is gone, the guys who got 10 bags and five bags, they get busy. They go to work. And what ends up happening is they double their master's investment by the time he returns. The master's ecstatic. 
It says, well done, thy good and faithful servant. You've been trusted with few things. Now I'll give you many things. But to the guy who had one bag, he just like buried it in the ground and twiddled his thumbs. And then the master came back and all the guy had to show was the original investment. The master said, what have you been doing with all your time? And the guy had some excuse. And the master said, no, you wicked, lazy servant. He was not happy. And church, we have a master too. He's on a long journey, so to speak. But he is coming back. And he's left his estate, this world, in the hands of his servants. And he's given us a job to do, and he expects us to do that job. He's empowered us to do that job. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be the wicked, lazy servant that is found wanting when the master gets back. This is not a job that we can wait till the last minute to try to do real quick and in a hurry. A couple of weeks ago, my, my wife and my son, they went to Champaign to go see her family. I stayed be home, and I had five days to get home improvement projects done. This was not including the bathroom drain. That's a separate ordeal. So I had five days to get these projects done. So for four days, I did the projects and did not clean up after myself. I had a door that was sitting in my kitchen. I had sawdust, drywall dust everywhere. There were dishes. There were tools. Like, it, the house was destroyed. But on the fifth day, I don't want to say the master was coming home because that's going to give her a big head. But, but somebody was coming home, all right, and she expected certain things to be done. So that day, I just cleaned, and I cleaned, and I cleaned, and I swept up the floor, and I vacuumed all the floors, and I got the door out of the kitchen, I washed all the dishes, I picked up my tools. I waited till the last minute, and I can do that because my house is not very big. But it's a whole lot easier to clean my 900-square-foot home than it is to preach to the 9,900 people who live in this community alone. And if we wait till the last minute to try to do that monumental task, we will fail. If we choose to kick the can down the road, we will run out of time. And we will find ourselves in the shoes of that servant who twiddled his thumbs because he forgot the master was coming home. That's not a risk I'm willing to take. Jesus is coming back. It may not be right this minute, but it is going to happen. And we have to, as a church, adopt the urgency and the realization that the master is coming home. We have work to do. We have to guard against inaction. That's the first obstacle, the first way we tend to fall into that. The second way is kind of on the other end of the spectrum. Sometimes we can become so fixated on Jesus and his return and all that that means that we forget about the work that he gave us to do today. We become so focused on what's coming, we, we kind of overlook the significance of today in this moment. And again, the apostles illustrate what this looks like. In verse 6, they ask Jesus a question. They say, Jesus, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel at this time? And really, they're, they're asking about end time stuff. They're saying, Jesus, are you, going to, are you going to bring justice upon this world? Are you going to set wrongs right? Are you going to liberate your people? Are you going to make peace across all the nations? Are you going to do this thing? That's the kind of thing that we want, we long for, right? I mean, when Jesus comes back, I want him to come back as much as the next guy because evil is done. It's stricken down. Satan goes to hell forever, all right? And the people that are abused and that are used and are devalued and demoralized, these systems and these structures that just crush people in this world, those structures come crumbling down and healing begins and righteousness reigns and everything is set right the way that God always intended it for it to be. That's what I yearn for in my deepest being. But I can't become so focused on that that I lose significance or I lose focus on the significance of today. Jesus seems to say the same thing. These disciples in verse 6, they say, are you going to restore the kingdom at this time? And Jesus says, it's not for you to know the times or dates. In other words, don't, don't worry about that. But here's what I want you to do today. I want you to be my witnesses in this city and in the countryside and to the very ends of the earth. Yeah, that day's coming, but there's a job to do right now. And in some ways, it reminds me of a passage out of the book of Hebrews chapter 4. This is a, a promise that God gave way back in the Old Testament to his Old Testament people. And the book of Hebrews picks it up to kind of contemporize it and to remind people that this is a promise that Jesus offers. It goes like this. It says, There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did from his. So let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following their, meaning ancient Israelites, example of disobedience. So if you know the creation story, you know that God worked for six days, and on the seventh day, Sabbath day, he rested from his works. 
And the promise that was given to the Old Testament people long, long ago was that there is a great Sabbath day, so to speak, where you will rest from your labors, not just for a weekend, but forever. It's the promise of this day that we're all looking forward to, where evil's done and justice reigns and wrongs are set right. It's this day we all yearn for. And what the book of Hebrews is saying is, hey, that day is still coming. That promise is still available to people through Jesus. That hope is still alive. That day's coming. But it ain't here yet. If you know the story, you know that God worked for six days and then the Sabbath day came later. If it's not the Sabbath day right now, if it's not that day of rest, which you can look outside and see clearly is not, where do you think we are in that timeline? We're in the days of work. Today's the day to get busy, church. That day is coming, the day when Christ returns, when, when justice reigns, when all is set right. But right now, this is the day of labor. This is the day of work, to do the work that Jesus has charged us with. Today, we have a job to do. And we can't afford to lose the significance of what's happening right in front of our face just because we desire what's coming next. It's kind of like raising kids in some ways. I was having this conversation with somebody in the hallway last week after church. Every phase of childhood has a unique challenge to it that, that we as parents, we just want to get through. We want to get through that challenge. We want to get on to the next phase so we can put this trouble behind us. When, when you're talking about your toddler, it's potty training. And we are feeling that right now. <laughs> I'm so sick of buying diapers. The toddlers are potty training. When you're in junior high, your kids are in junior high, it's puberty and all that that entails. When your kids are in high school, it's that, that thirst for independence and that emerging adulthood and that, that tension of them trying to grow up and yet still be your kid. These are challenges, and every parent wrestles with them. And sometimes we yearn for these challenges to be put behind us and to move on to the next phase. But there's also beautiful stuff happening in every one of these phases that we will miss if we are just looking forward to the future. With toddlers, yes, potty training is a trial, but you get to watch them just learn so much and become little people. When they're in junior high, yes, puberty is a challenge, but that also opens the doors for them to experience so many new facets of what it means to be alive and to feel things and to love in a new way. And, and it's an exciting time for them. As high schoolers, yes, that, that tension and that thirst for, for independence can be challenging, but you also get to watch your kids become adults and be proud of how they handle life and its challenges and be proud of the adults that they are becoming. There are challenges that we want to get through, but we can't look so forward to the future that we miss the significance of right now. And yeah, we yearn for Christ to return, and we yearn for what God is going to do and how things are going to be set right. But there is important work in front of us right here, right now, and what we choose to do today actually makes the end of the story even better. And I don't even mean better for us. Our faithfulness in this work today makes eternity better for God. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. There's a passage in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18 I want to share with you. And it's just, it's, it's a little, little passage. It's easy to look over. But somebody pointed this out to me one time, and, and it really, man, it changed the way I saw myself and the way I understood the church and even how I understood God's desire for people outside of the church to know Christ. So here it is, Ephesians 1, 18. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope which he has called you. Here's the, here's the part I want to zero in on. You are the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. Let me say that again. The riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. That's who you are to God. So let me break down what that means. When Jesus comes back, or when we die and go to heaven, whichever comes first, we are all probably looking forward to eternal life. No more hunger, no more sickness, no more pain, wipe every tear from every eye, all that stuff. That's our inheritance. That's what we're looking forward to. God already has all that. He already lives eternally. He already has no more hunger, no more pain. His heart breaks, but physical pain, by all that, he doesn't have only that. Here's what God's looking forward to, either when Jesus comes back or we go to heaven, whichever comes first. You. And not just you individually, but you collectively as his people in this building. You collectively in every church that worships him today and in past era and in eras to come. His people, his children, that's what he's looking forward to. That's his prize after all of this is said and done. That's what he yearns for and desires, to be with you. 
and not just in a, a somewhat removed, distant way, to be face-to-face in his presence for all eternity to be with you and to love you. That's his reward. And when you and I choose to be faithful and to tell people about what he's done and to make straight paths for more people to enter his family, the more people that say yes to Jesus, the greater his family becomes, the more joy he experiences for all eternity. Church, this is our opportunity to actually give God something back for everything that he has done for us. And that's what we call worship. More than any song we could ever sing, more than any style of music that we could adapt or adopt, this, this act of faithfulness and obedience, of telling people about his plan and his love and his son, bringing people to the creator and the father, that is worship. And that's the kind of church we want to be. We at FCC, we want to overcome in action by worshiping in action. You follow me? We we announced several months ago, back in April, that we're going to be making some changes on Sunday morning. This is going to be a bit of a transition. Those transitions, they they entail two changes mainly. One is our song service. Uh, It doesn't affect this group of people too much, but our first service is giving up a lot to come along on this journey with us because the band will be playing in both services. And we're going to work to incorporate some hymns and familiar songs, but all of our music will be of a contemporary style. And the reason we're doing that is not because we want to be a new church or young church or whatever. It's because we want to do the job God gave us to do. And we truly believe that it is easier to connect with people in our community with music that they recognize and resonate with. This is about the mission. The second change we're going to be rolling out April 21st is a time change. Our services will meet at 9 and 1030, and we will have the opportunity for small groups to meet simultaneously alongside both of those services. The reason we're doing that is because we truly believe in the power of connection. We're not meant to do faith or life alone. Faith and life are both richest when we connect with other people in meaningful relationships. And so we want to provide the opportunity for people to meet together. One of the obstacles that we hear again and again is, I have kids, will there be kid care? And my schedule is so busy because our kids and and I were doing stuff every night of the week. And schedule becomes so difficult for people in order to meet and have a small group. This eliminates about 90% of that. Sunday morning at 9 or 10.30, you have the opportunity to be in a small group, to gather with people. You're already in the building, I hope. And then when you're done, you come worship or you worship and then go to your small group, whichever option you choose. It eliminates so many of the obstacles. And here's why I'm stressing this to you. So many of those obstacles and those people that we've spoken to and said, I can't do this, you are those people. And we are trying to make straight paths and clear the path for you to be involved in a small group because we believe in this, that growth happens when we are together. And I would encourage you to take that act and to take that step and say, I want to be in a small group, even if it meets for an hour on Sunday morning, because that's better than nothing. We believe that growth is what we're called to as well, not just to bring people in the door, but to make actual disciples of people who know Jesus, who love him, and who follow him. That's how we do this. We believe in these changes, and that's why we're making them. It's not about a music style. It's not about trying to grow a bigger church. It's not about growing a younger church or a newer church. It's not about my personal preferences as the pastor. Because if I'm going to be 100% honest, my personal preference is to have people happy and to make my job easy. And neither of those happen when you start changing things in a church. But we're making these changes because we believe we have a job to do. We will not sit on our hands and twiddle our thumbs. We will not stare up at the sky because there's work to be done in this part of the gospel story. My hope that we can all adopt that urgency and go on this journey together. FCC is a restoration movement church, and what that means is is one of the the pillars that we're built on is this desire to be an Acts 2 church. Acts 2 is where the church started, and when we say that, we mean that we want to go back to the Bible and do the things that the church did in the Bible and use that as our instruction manual. But if we're really going to become an Acts chapter 2 church, we have to overcome Acts chapter 1 obstacles, and we have to act. We have to be aware of the tendency to sit and instead choose to go. And on that note, I want to talk to you a little bit about the Just One Challenge. We rolled this out last week and kind of gave you this idea of what was coming. I want to flesh it out a little bit. If you weren't here last week, the Just One Challenge is this. We all have one person in our life that needs to hear this message of Jesus. 
and that needs what God is offering to save. We do, just flat out. You may be saying to yourself, well, I don't know anybody that isn't a Christian. If you sit down and think about it, you'll find one. I found one. I just moved here a year ago. We've all got one. And here's the thing. I, I can't preach to everybody in the world, even though everybody deserves to hear it. I can't even preach to everybody in this city, even though they need to hear it. But I can tell one person about Christ. I can invite that one person to come and to hear about Jesus. And so can you. You can tell. You can invite. Easter's coming. It's a great opportunity to say, hey, I want you to share this with me. Just one person. Each of you found on your seats this morning two cards, business cards. They're perforated. Here's what I want you to do with those. We're going to take a couple minutes here in a second. We're going to pray. And I want you to ask that God would reveal who your one is. Who's the person he put on your heart? And I want you to write their first name on both of those cards. Tear them apart. You keep one. You take it home, you put it on your bathroom mirror, you put it on your steering wheel, you, you put it somewhere you're going to see it every day, and when you see it, you pray for that person right then and there. And you pray that God would open their heart and open their mind to hear what he's trying to tell them. And you pray for boldness, and you pray for opportunities, and you pray for words that the Holy Spirit will give you because you have the same power as the apostles. And you ask God, use me and to help me, give me opportunity, help me see the way to talk to this person or to share the gospel with this person or to invite this person because they're on my heart. They burden me the way that they burden you and I want to be a part of what you're doing. You hold on to that one. And then as we take communion here in just a minute, I want you to take that other one. And as you partake in the emblems, there's a basket at each and every station. Just put the other card in that basket because we want to pray for your ones too. We're in this together. We are a body. We are a team and together we're going to carry this burden, and together we're going to be a faithful church. And that means we want to share the burden with you. We want to pray for you, your ones. We want to care about your ones. We want to pray for you. We want to pray that you are equipped. We want to pray for your boldness. We want to be in this together. So on that note, I want to pray for you guys, and then you'll have a couple minutes. Pray to yourselves. Write down your names, and then Sam is going to come up and lead us in communion. Father, thank you for today. And I thank you for the opportunity just to be a part of what you're doing in this world. And I don't understand why you included us, because you could do this way better without us. But this and your wisdom is what you've chosen. And we're just honored to come along for the ride. And I ask that you would use us, that you would empower us to use the gifts that you've given us, use the relationships that we have to speak to people about your love, not because they're a project, but because we care about them. I pray that Jesus will become so significant to us and that his return will become such an urgent matter in our hearts and our minds that we would choose to act, that we would choose to avoid inaction, that we would choose to just be faithful to what you've called us, realizing that this is worship before you. And I pray that you would honor those labors, that we would see fruit from the harvest. I pray, Lord, that seeds would be sown, that conversations would take place. I pray that this just one challenge would be just the beginning of a new endeavor and a new heart that beats within us to make you great in the people in our lives that we care about. But most of all, Father, I just pray that you honor, exalt yourself, that you're worshiped in this. And that when we stand before you on the day, there are many, many souls who stand alongside us to make your inheritance great. It's in the name of Jesus we pray these things. Amen. Take a couple minutes. Pray. Ask God to reveal your one.